Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, a free site, BettingAngle.us, a free site. It is Saturday, October the 19th, 2019. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, Arthur Baturbiev delivered for us. If you Google the pre-fight video here, you'll see that a couple of months ago, on August the 23rd, 2019, I made a pre-fight video where I suggested a hedge. Baturbiev by KO, hedged with the over in the fight. So I'm guessing some gamblers out there won both sides of the play and are watching this video from, let's say, either the bar of their choice, even though it's 7.01 a.m. Pacific time here, or from the hotel room that they blew the money on uh, in celebration of their win. Well, let's talk about the fight. First, let me say this. Somebody in the comments section of the pre-fight video asked me about a fight I hope happens. David Benavides, unbeaten. Unbeaten, 168-pound champion. Against Caleb Plant, unbeaten, 168-pound champion. Let me just tell you, the place where you make your money gambling, in my opinion, is by discovering uh, elite talent that hasn't yet been recognized by the public and uh, investing in that talent, right? I think Caleb Plant is special. I think he's better than David Benavides. Since Benavides was just favored over Anthony Durrell, big, I'm expecting Benavides to be favored in that fight. I view that fight as a betting opportunity. Quite frankly, I think Caleb Plant might be the best at 168 pounds, period. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. Let's talk about this fight. Let me just say, this fight was excellent across the board. It was boxing at its best. Not necessarily in terms of the fight itself, because we're going to look at the mistakes that Grosstick makes, right? The better athlete with the biggest punch in the fight. Grosstick's straight right hand in my opinion, is more concussive than anything Baturbia throws. Right? And Grosdick had to reach. But I thought he made mistakes. But where this fight exceeded itself, and we'll forgive ESPN for keeping us hostage, waiting for this fight, right? I turned on my TV, I was watching Pitt football. This is why I preferred to zone to ESPN. Um, I'm watching Pitt football. Then, of course, you had the Colazzo fight. By the time this fight came around, you know, you were about, let's say, 90 minutes past when you thought the fight was going to start. Well, let me just say, first, there was a superstar performance in the ring. And it was from the referee, Gary Rosado. Folks, the fight takes place in Philly, a fight town. I'm just telling you, you had a serious referee in the ring. This fight could have been a disaster. As you can imagine, there was some wrestling in there. A gross stick hits the canvas multiple times off wrestling moves. Right? There was some wrestling in there. Um, there was some hands held behind the head in there. Uh, it was rough and tumble. Now, with a bad ref, you could have ended up with a disaster like the Anthony Joshua Joseph Parker fight. But this ref was excellent. Does not blink. Calls a knockdown in the first round. Gets overruled. Gets overruled. Very professional. Just continues about his business. Just continues to referee the fight. But Terby if tries to play rough guy in there. The ref warns him in such a way that you understood. The ref was in charge. Gary Rosado is a guy I hope promoters put on speed dial. Because we're in an era right now where these heavyweights are awfully big. It gets rough and tumble. A fight like Wilder Ortiz 2 needs a ref who's going to keep the order. 
right? I believe this guy is championship level. Let's talk about the fighters. Now, let me just say this. I thought on the telecast, Timothy Bradley and Andre Ward were inspired, right? They made the point that these guys came up in the same system, right? They're only two years apart. Viterbius 34, Grove Sticks 32. They come up in the same system. They're aware of each other. They're fighting in the same weight class. Right? So Andre Ward makes the point that the two guys, even though they only fought once before, and Baturbi have won that fight, they point that out. Right? Know all about the other fighter. Right? Just like right now, we know Deontay Wilder knows all about Anthony Joshua. Joshua knows all about Deontay Wilder because they're rivals, they're contemporaries, they're in the same weight class, they want the same prize, supremacy of the division. That's who these guys were. This fight was several years in the making. People were surprised that the two guys fought each other, but understand, for each guy, the other guy was an itch they needed to scratch. So I thought Ward and Bradley did an excellent job on the telecast. Ward, once the fight started and you saw that Paterbiev was the hunter, Grosdick was the hunted, that Paterbiev was disrespecting Grosdick's power. Andre Ward said, look, this looks like big brother versus little brother. There certainly was a mental component to the fight. I don't want to overlook that. But understand, I'm a believer in the math of a fight. We'll call it the math. The actual tactical moves you need to make, whether or not your game plan can work, whether or not in this fight, whether or not the execution of the game plan is on par. My bias is I believe you can be terrified of an opponent. You know, George Foreman to this day talks about how he was terrified of Joe Fraser, a guy he KO'd twice. Right? You can be terrified of a guy. But if your math is right, if your game plan is right, if you know what you're doing, right, you can still win the fight because you have the other guy outthought, right? You have a game plan that says, hey, when he does this, I'm going to throw a right hand. And if when he does this, the right hand's open and you throw it as terrified as you are. And if that right hand continually lands and slows down the other guy, you'll have the upper hand. Now here, you had a wrinkle that was tremendous for fight fans like you and me. They went to the corners. You had mics in the corners. But in this fight, you didn't have cornermen whispering in the ear of their fighter. You actually had vocal cornermen. So you had Teddy Atlas in the corner of Grove's Dick. And Atlas is talking to Grosdick, and you could tell they had a game plan. We know what that game plan was. This fight, at the end of the day, was a fight about spacing and pacing. Right? Let me repeat that. Spacing and pacing. Understand, Grosdick has so many advantages coming into the ring, in my opinion. I'm not kidding when I say that straight right hand of his is a special punch. It's like Deontay Wilder's straight right hand. Right? It's a special punch. It changes things. So he's fighting a warrior. He's fighting Adonis Stevenson, several year reigning champion. A guy who's a puncher himself. Adonis Stevenson's straight left hand is a special punch. Right? You know the special punches when you see him. And Groves Dick in a rough and tumble match where the round before is very contested 
lands that straight right hand on Adana Stevenson and life changes. Stop Stevenson in his tracks. Stevenson ends up getting stopped, later collapses. Thank God he is recovered. Now, Baturbiev hits hard, but he doesn't have, in my opinion, that one punch. He's more of a accumulation puncher. He doesn't have that one punch that, regardless of what's happening, can stop traffic, can completely end a fight. In my opinion, the hardest single punch that either fighter had going into this fight was Grove Sticks straight right. Right? Now, Teddy Atlas, trainer emeritus, a guy who's had multiple champs, a guy who's been involved in working with Mike Tyson and many others, right? Many others. Michael Moore, Alexander Povetkin. Teddy Atlas is here with Grosnick, and Atlas is telling him in the corner. And more importantly, it's caught on Mike. We're hearing it. He's telling him, don't throw the punch too close to Paterbiev. Right? Who's shorter handed? Who's shorter? Right? Atlas, at one point, is so exasperated, he literally blurts out. Don't be too close so he can counter you. Right? Atlas understands that his guy from distance has the advantage. Grosdick wants this fight on the outer rim of the pocket. Right? He wants to be able to throw right hands and if they miss, if they don't quite catch Baturbiev, he doesn't want his guy on the follow-through to be so close to Baturbiev that Baturbiev then counters him. So you understood. Grostick needed a set of skills to be outside, to know how to throw the punch and roll away. You know who does that well? Canelo. Right. In fact, I'm going to name some fighters here because I believe fighting looks random. The great fighters do things that a nervous fighter like Grosnick, caught up in the moment, did not do in the fight. Right. So understand, Grosnick, who has a jab, needed to control distance. Timothy Bradley on the telecast is talking about how Grow sticks one, two. It's a jab followed by that right hand. Was there for him. Right? That should have been the focus of his attack with a spacing dynamic. Right? Throw the punch from far away. Be able to roll away. He's facing a two handed opponent. Be able to roll away from Baturbiev's you know, base, if you throw the punch and you miss, even if you land the punch, right, don't land it in such a way where you're there for a counter. You don't want a shootout. So understand, spacing-wise, Grostick wants space. He has the longer reach. He has the longer power. In terms of pacing, Grosnick wants a slower pace. He doesn't want a brawl. He wants to control and see the counters. So who Grosnick needed to be, right, was Vitaly Klitschko. I'm just naming iconic fighters who to me stand for certain fight styles. Right, he needed to be able to throw a jab. If Paterbiev, who's a slower version of Mike Tyson. Right? You know who Paterbiev reminded me of too? Marvin Hagler. Right? These are the rough and tumble guys who just assume 
that they have a right to hunt you down. That whatever you're throwing back, right, you could be Thomas the Hitman Hermes, right? This Marvin Hagler type guy is going to just try to walk through your power. The idea is, hey, if we trade, I win. Right? Understand, at 34, an age when Tyson was done, at 34, well past his prime, at 34, Paterbiev doesn't have blinding hand speed. He's at a hand speed disadvantage. Right? Just to understand, he doesn't have the reflexes of Grove Stick. Physically, Grove Stick has the advantage. Right? But just to understand, technique wise, Andre Ward mentions it. Whereas Vitaly's center of gravity allowed him to lean back, you would think guys with a jab and long power would just master the art of leaning back. So if they're a little bit too close to the pocket, that lean is going to protect them. The other guy particularly a guy with a shorter reach, like Baturbiev, is going to have to really reach in, really collapse the pocket to hit them. You would think the lean would allow them to get close enough to throw a jab while remaining cocked to throw their signature right hand. Here, Grove Stick's balance is completely off. Right as Andre Ward mentions, sometimes Grove Stick's face is in front of his feet. Right? You need a different balance. When we're here online analyzing fights, one of the biggest things I look for is a fighter's balance. Right? If a fighter needs to be far away from his opponent, if his gifts are more long range, if he has long range missiles instead of short range missiles, right? you knew Baturbiev in the pocket short range had the advantage. Right, long range, Grostick needed to have something to keep Baturbiev away from him. Right, you know this Marvin Hagler mindset, the guy's always going to be there. You open the door, the guy's right there. Right, you knew Baturbiev was always going to be there. He's always going to be coming forward. Right, you knew that. You knew in Baturbiev's mind, hey, if, if I can just get us to trade, I win this fight. You knew that from the opening bell. So Groves Dick needed to have something to avoid the creation of a normal pocket. He wants as big a pocket as possible. So he should have had a lean back. He should have been throwing jabs whether or not he follows up with the right hand. Right? You want to hide the power. You want to throw jabs. You want to double and triple the jab. Why? Because you know the Mike Tyson guy is going to try to collapse the pocket. So you want to be Buster Douglas, don't you? Right? Vitaly Klitschko against Sam Peter. Same thing. Right? You want to batter the guy with the jab. Then when the guy gets distracted, boom, here's the right hand. Right? But, but that's not who Grove Stick is. Grove Stick is a KO puncher in his own right. That's how he sees himself. So I'm guessing in camp, especially hearing Teddy Atlas in the corner, Teddy Atlas knew exactly what his fighter needed to do. Teddy Atlas wanted a long game. He wanted Grove Stick outside. Right? He wanted Grovesdick doing things where he's throwing power punches, but he's not around for the counter. Right? Throw the punch, move away. David Hay was good at that. Throw the punch, roll away. Right? That's not the fighter he had. I'm guessing once the fight started and the bullets started flying, Grovesdick reverted to who he is. When he's fighting a guy who respects his power, who understands that he's a Olympic medalist, a bronze medalist, that he was the man in the Ukraine, big time amateur background, 
right? Grovestick was expecting to be Big Brother, right? That's who he reverted to. But he was fighting a guy who just mentally viewed him as little brother, didn't give him the deference, right? Regardless of Grovestick's power, Baturbiev is trying to collapse the pocket, and Grovestick gets lulled into a shootout. Let me name another fighter. It's a part of his game that, quite frankly, I haven't seen that often. Right? Even when you're a long-range guy, you understand that eventually, this is pro fighting, you're fighting a world-class opponent. In this case, you're fighting, you know, um, a two-time Russian Olympian who has a share of the belt. You know the guy's going to get inside. Even when you have you know, an above average jab and long range power. You know the guy's going to get inside. So when he gets inside, you need to find a way to break his rhythm, don't you? You need to have a way to turtle, to slow down the fight. Because it's not just spacing, it's pacing. Right? If the fight gets fast and rough and tumble and inside, Baturbiev has the clear advantage. Grovestick wants the wider fight. Grovestick wants the slower fight. So, when someone collapses the pocket, Carlos Baldemir, that's a fight I enjoy. Right? When someone collapses the pocket on Floyd Mayweather, again, I'm just naming great fighters iconic fighters. First of all, Mayweather's a side profile, right? He's taking away one arm because understand, you're not allowed to hit a guy in the back. You don't want to face a two-handed opponent and be parallel to him. You don't want your body in front of him. That's not what you want. You want to eliminate one of his hands by only giving him a side profile. If he's going to hit you in the body, he has to do so here. The strike zone is smaller. Let me also say too, you knew Baturbiev is going to try to throw hooks to the side of your head. You knew that. So why wouldn't you model yourself after, name the fighter, Archie Moore, Kenny Norton, George Foreman. Right, understand, I've just named three murderous punchers, big time punchers, and these guys had defensive moves. They weren't there to just trade with you. They had defensive moves. So if I'm like this and Baturbiev comes inside on me, rather than throw a lot of punches and stuff like that, if I know Baturbiev wants to hit me on this side of the head, because keep in mind, this other side is too far away. It's on the other side of the ring. So if I know Baturbiev is a guy who likes to throw hooks to the side of my head, don't I do what Archie Moore, Ken Norton, and George Foreman did? Don't I have a hand like this? Right? Mayweather was so good. Occasionally Mayweather had a hand up, but Mayweather was so good with the shoulder and 3D with the knees that Mayweather would just have his head tucked and would duck down. So the punch is bouncing off his shoulder. If you're fighting Baturbiev and you know he's a hooker to the side of your head and you know he has short arms and he wants to be up on you in the pocket, don't you have a turtle move where you protect your body and protect the side of your head while slowing down his volume without engaging in a shootout up close. Grovesdick couldn't do that. Baturbia crashes the pocket and a war ensues. As I watched the beginning of this fight, and I thought Grovesdick clearly won the first round. Clearly. Right? The knockdown wasn't a knockdown. They got that right. They corrected the ref. But as I watched the first round, I realized he's expending too much energy. He's moving too much. 
right? You needed a setup that almost lulled you to sleep. Where the guy is outside, but he's not dancing as much as Growstick is. He's not moving as much. He's more like Vitaly Klitschko. He's outside. He's shooting a jab. He's throwing his signature right hand, right? The whole point of the exercise is to be able to throw and land that right hand. You know he's executing properly if his best punch is landing. Right? Then, when the guy gets inside, because eventually a guy like Baturbiev is going to slip your jab, right? Because everyone wants to keep him outside. Just like Mike Tyson's going to slip your jab. Just like Hagler's going to slip your jab. When he slips your jab and comes inside, and Ali would clinch, right? He would clinch the guy in such a way that the guy's tied up. He can't throw punches. A Floyd Mayweather would turtle, right? Now, Mayweather also has an excellent left hook, so there's always that threat when Mayweather is standing in front of you. But you understood. Mayweather's body's off at the side. You're not going to be able to collapse the pocket and find open real estate on Mayweather. When Baturbiev crashes the pocket here, there's too much of growth stick. Right? Let me say this. Growth stick's too parallel to him. Baturbiev, who's not a body puncher, realizes that the body's open. He starts to go for the body. You'll notice when growth stick tries to clinch him, he doesn't do it properly. So sometimes he clinches, sometimes he clinches Paterbiev, and guess what? Paterbiev has a right hand free. Isn't that what you're trying to prevent him from throwing? He has a right hand free. And you know what he's doing with the right hand while he's clinched? He's hitting growth stick to the body. What I want people to do is to look at Mayweather against Shane Mosley. Mayweather's badly hurt, folks. Mayweather grabs his arm. That's his clinch move. If you're going to clinch a guy, you need to know how to clinch the guy. I didn't think Grovestick clinched the right way. So inside, you have a mismatch. You have Grovestick expending too much energy. You have Baturbi of hitting him to the body. Understand what that does. It not only drains your stamina, it hurts your ability to throw your long right hand. Because sooner or later your torso is in pain. You get ready to throw that right hand, you're feeling pain. You don't have the leverage you had when you were completely healthy at the beginning of the fight. Let me also say this too. Boxing, a hell of a lot happens between punches. I think it's a mistake to just focus on the punches. Inside, Perturbiev was a master at moves that are technically supposed to be illegal. Right? It's an optical illusion. But what I want you to do is to look at the number of times inside. First off, why is Grove Stick bending over? He's the taller man. He's a taller man. Why is he bending over and being low enough where Baturbiev is able to get his hand, get his arm on the back of Grosdick's neck? This happens repeatedly in the fight. I'm just telling you nothing drains your power more than having a guy lean on the back of your neck repeatedly. Google Shane Mosley's comments after the Mayweather fight. Mosley feels that Mayweather drained his power by leaning on the back of his neck. Now, Baturbiev is a pro. He has that move down to a science. So what would happen is they would grapple inside. Grosdick would do the worst thing imaginable, to hide his body. Rather than move away, rather than turn his back to the fighter and walk away, what Bernard Hopkins would do. Right? You want to walk away to create space. Because your power is long range. Isn't that what you want? To leave the pocket. 
No, Grove Stick stays in the pocket and he bends down. So then you have Perturbiev. Now we all understand. In boxing, sometimes your arm's going to be behind the other guy's head. Unintentionally. Right? I throw a punch, you duck under it. Your head's here, my arm's going to be here. Right? So Groves, so Baturbiev looks like a Boy Scout. He looks like a choir boy. He looks innocent. But yet you notice, he keeps his arm there. Then he leans down, but he makes it look like he's not leaning. Look at the look on his face. He's looking at the referee as if he's an innocent. Folks, he leaned on the back of Grovestick's neck round after round. And I'm just telling you, that wore down Grovestick as much as anything else. Also, Baturbiev realized that he had a guy who was too parallel to him in the pocket. So, Baturbiev, who's not a body puncher, becomes a body puncher. Right? Gro Grovestick, technique-wise, isn't at a side profile enough. I know this video is running too long. Let me just say two. You have a great straight right hand. Right? To set it up. And I know boxing doesn't allow this. I'm not allowed to just have a hand like this and just push you in place or hold you in place while I hit you with the other hand. But in boxing we all understand sometimes you throw a punch and it lingers out there. What I found is guys with great long right hands, which is what Grosdick has, right, understand how to push you out there. Have a hand that's a range finder while making it look legal. So rather than me just have my hand stiff as a pole and just place it on your shoulder and then hit you with this hand. Right? What I do is I pretend to be throwing a jab, right? You know, I throw some type of jab. Then <laughs> when the jab's extended, that's when I hold you and I throw you, you know, I throw the big right hand. Right, Grosdick, in my opinion, didn't do enough, didn't jab enough, didn't hold enough, didn't push Baturbiev enough. We just saw a fight, Derevianchenko against Golovkin, where Derevianchenko literally pushes, right, pushes Golovkin outside so he could do moves. He could start a sequence. Look at the George Foreman-Joe Fraser fight. Look at the Lennox Lewis-Mike Tyson fight. Sometimes when a guy wants you outside, he'll literally push you outside. You, you had none of that here. Right? Grovesdick didn't set up his Sunday punch the way you thought he would. Instead, the fight gets away from him. The spacing's off because Baturiev's continually crashing the pocket. He's too close. The pacing's off because it's rough and tumble. Not a measured fight, they're wrestling inside. Grosdick's getting thrown to the canvas. Right, when the ref comes to separate them, Baturbiev continues punching. At one point, the ref says to Baturbiev, when I say to stop, you need to stop. Well, understand, it should never get that rough and tumble. Grosdick should have been turtled like Floyd. Protect it. Not being able to get hit on the side of the head. That's the other thing. Viterbiev's up close and he's throwing punches on the side of Grovesdick's head. Grovesdick's the taller man. Him leaning forward and getting hit on the side of the head would be as preposterous, is as preposterous, as if Vitaly Klitschko gave up his height and decided to lean forward so you could hit him on the side of the head. If you're the taller fighter with the longer power, why aren't you able to lean backwards? Why doesn't your center of gravity allow you to lean backwards so you're not in range, so your height prevents the shorter man from being able to put his hand on the back of your neck 
leaning on it, and from being able to get up close and to hit you on the side of the head. Right, so let me just uh, say that there's a moment where they go to Baturbiev's corner. And his cornerman's excellent as well. And his cornerman literally says, on the telecast, you hear him saying to his fighter, all this guy has is a straight right hand. <coughs> Everyone in the building knew that that's the punch Grosdick's trying to land. So Baturbiev's corner is basically telling him, slip the punch, pin him. Right? Pin him. Move to your left, prevent him from getting out. Atlas says to his fighter, don't get caught on the ropes. Grosdick repeatedly is caught up in the end of exchanges. In other words, you know he's lost the exchange when Baturbiev's hand, his arm, just happens to be on the back of Grovestick's head. In other words, you know Grovestick's not leaning back. You know he's not far enough away to hit his Sunday punch without getting countered. You know he doesn't clinch well. You know once Baturbiev gets deep in the pocket, there's going to be a scuffle. Grovestick won't be able to take the air out of the exchange like Floyd Mayweather did repeatedly by having guys walk into his shoulder and hiding his head and having a side profile. So Grovestick, in my opinion, got nervous here. I believe this was the fight he wanted. Right, he had the hand speed, he had the size, he has the best punch in the fight, he's coming off his biggest win. Right, he's the champ. Finally, he gets the Russian gold medalist who was above him in the amateurs. Finally, he gets a shot at redemption for an amateur fight he lost years ago. Right, I believe this was the fight he wanted. When the fight came, he was too nervous to operate. He wins the first round, but he's expending a hell of a lot of energy. I agree with Max Kellerman. Kellerman, after six rounds, has the fight even. Right? The problem is, Baturbiev keeps coming. Right? Again, this is Tyson. This is Hagler. Right? Baturbiev keeps coming. Right? Grosdick never is able to shift this fight into a comfortable gear where he's able to stay outside, he's able to throw big punches from distance. Let me mention one fight that people need to see because it kind of mirrors this fight. It's what Grosdick should have been doing. Right? Look at the Roberto Duran, Thomas the Hitman Hearns fight. Right? You understood inside, given that Hearns was a much taller fighter, given that Duran, the shorter man, was a master inside. If Duran got inside, you knew Hearns was going to be in trouble. So there you notice, right? Hearns, an Emmanuel Stewart fighter, keeping Duran outside in a way Ray Leonard couldn't. Keeping Duran outside and then coming across with his right hand. That's the fight ideally Grovesdick should have fought. Right? You don't see Hearns bending over the last place you want the side of your head to be is at the end of a Duran hook. Right? The fight's on YouTube. Please, look it up. Right? Also, look at the pacing of that fight. Measured. Right? You know, Duran's trying to come forward. Can't. Kept outside. Here, Grovestick controlled neither the spacing nor the pacing. His execution was off, even though he was the better athlete with the better tools. He lost the fight.
even with his corner, saying, stay outside. Don't, don't be too close when you throw your punches. Don't be close enough to him to get countered. Even with his corner giving him you know, great advice, quite frankly, he got caught up in the moment, just like Ray Leonard did the first fight against Duran. He got caught up in the moment. His game plan fell off. Boxing's about discipline, strategy. He was undisciplined. He wasn't able to follow his strategy. He got stopped. Gamblers won both sides of the hedge. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.